Welcome to the Ultimate Beginner's Guide to the Elliott Wave Theory. In this free video course, you will learn the overall rules and guidelines of the Elliott Wave Theory, how to identify basic market movements, several wave characteristics like equality, alternation, truncation, and targets. You will also learn how institutional and retail traders use the Elliott Wave Theory as a roadmap to understand price action and to forecast significant price reversals. You will understand how to trade using Elliott Waves as a beginner, and last but not least, the main advantages and disadvantages of the theory. If you're new to this channel, please consider leaving your like and subscribing right now, as this helps support the ongoing creation of free videos like this one. You can also check the Ultimate Beginner's Guide playlist in the video card or in the video description for more free courses similar to this one. Without further ado, let's begin the course. The Elliott Wave Theory was created by Ralph Nelson Elliott. Elliott was an American accountant that began studying the financial markets in the early 30s. The result from that study was a book called The Wave Principle. In this book, Elliott claimed that the market followed natural laws that could be measured with Fibonacci numbers. In the 40s, Elliott expanded his ideas beyond the market and wrote a book with an ambitious title called Nature's Law. The Secret of the Universe. He passed away two years after that. The Elliott Wave Theory is grounded on a very basic assumption, which is that the market moves in a 5-3 wave pattern. In other words, the market advances for 5 waves, and then retraces or corrects for 3 waves. This is the central idea from which all the rules and guidelines of the Elliott Wave Theory come from. The five waves that advance price in one direction collectively form one motive wave and they are labeled from one to five. The three waves that retrace against the motive wave collectively form one corrective wave and they are labeled from A to C. Notice that the large motive wave is broken down into five subwaves. The large corrective wave is broken down into three subwaves. Here we arrive at the definition of impulse and corrective waves. In other words, a wave that goes in the same direction as the wave in a larger degree is called impulse wave, and the wave that goes in the opposite direction of the wave in a larger degree is called corrective wave. In that sense, waves 1, 3, 5, A, and C are impulse waves because they go in the same direction of the wave in a larger degree. Waves 2, 4, and B are considered to be corrective waves because they go in the opposite direction of the wave in the larger degree. Notice that we have this idea of wave degrees, meaning that waves repeat inside themselves in multiple degrees. In other words, Elliott waves have a fractal quality. In this illustration, you can see the fundamental 5-3 wave pattern repeating inside itself in three different degrees. Notice how the illustration begins to resemble price section as more degrees are shown. According to the Elliott wave theory, there are nine wave degrees, and there is a labeling convention to keep things neatly organized. The largest cycle of all is called the grand supercycle. Then we have the supercycle, the cycle, which is the wave count that spans from years to decades, the primary degree, which is the wave count that spans from months to years, the intermediate degree, which is the wave count that spans from weeks to months, the minor degree, which is the wave count that spans from days to weeks, the minute degree, the minuet, and finally, the sub-minuet degree. Trying to keep track of all nine wave degrees is not a productive exercise. Keeping track of three wave degrees is already a challenge because there are instances where you will find multiple possible wave counts in each wave degree. There are three elements that characterize Elliott waves. They are form, ratio, and time. The waveform is the fundamental 5-3 pattern we already talked about. This is the most important element. The ratio element is the vertical ratio between waves, which is often used in combination with Fibonacci tools. According to the theory, distinct waves will respect specific Fibonacci ratios, and that can be useful in certain aspects of the analysis. The third element is time, which is the horizontal ratio between different waves which also respect Fibonacci ratios according to the theory. Out of these three elements, the form takes precedence over the others. 
In other words, the 5-3 pattern is more important than the vertical and horizontal ratios between different waves. The Elliott wave theory has different rules and guidelines. Before exploring each rule and guideline, it's important to note that rules cannot be broken, otherwise the wave count is discarded. The guidelines are more flexible. Let's take a look at the main rules of the Elliott wave theory first. Rule number one is that wave two cannot extend beyond the start of wave one. If that happens, we are not talking about waves one and two anymore. Rule number two is that wave three cannot be the shortest wave. Rule number three is that wave four cannot retrace into the price territory of wave one. These are simple objective rules that allow the trader to discard many invalid wave counts. Beyond these three main rules, there are two more rules that are a bit more specific. All motive and impulse waves must have five subwaves, and even though wave five might not surpass wave three, wave three must always surpass wave one. Let's see a hypothetical example of rule number one. In the first wave count, we can see that wave two doesn't surpass the beginning of wave one. That is a correct wave count according to the first rule. In the second wave count, we can see that the second wave surpasses the beginning of the first wave therefore, the wave count is incorrect. This cannot be considered a wave 2, it's something else. Rule number 2 states that wave 3 cannot be the shortest wave. This rule will help you if you find yourself in a situation like this, where the middle wave is the shortest. This cannot be a wave 3, which is usually the largest wave in the count. What is being labeled as wave 3, 4, and 5 here is usually the waves 1, 2, and 3 of an extended wave 3 in a lower degree, which is something we'll talk about later in greater detail. Rule number 3 states that wave 4 must not retrace into the territory of wave 1. If it does, we are not talking about a wave 4 anymore. In this illustration, you can see a hypothetical wave count where the wave 4 retraces into the territory of wave 1. If this is the case, we need to discard this wave count as it breaks the third rule. On the right you can see a correct wave count according to the third rule because wave 4 does not retrace into the territory of wave 1. Rule number 4 states that all motive and impulse waves must have 5 subwaves. In other words, the subwaves that go in the direction of the wave in a larger degree must always have 5 waves, otherwise we are not talking about motive and impulse waves anymore. On the left, we can see a hypothetical example of what would be a correct representation of impulse and motive waves. The subwaves that go in the direction of the wave in the larger degree move in patterns of five subwaves. On the right, we can see an example of incorrect wave count, where the subwaves that go in the same direction of the wave in a larger degree move in patterns of three. Rule number five claims that even though wave five doesn't have to surpass wave number three, Wave 3 must always surpass wave number 1, otherwise we are not talking about a wave 3 anymore. On the left, we can see an example of an incorrect wave count because wave 3 fails to surpass the ending point of wave 1. On the right, we can see an example of a correct wave count because even though wave 5 fails to surpass wave 3 in a phenomenon called as truncation, wave 3 surpasses wave 1. These five rules will already give you a good starting point for performing wave counts correctly as they will help you eliminate many incorrect wave counts. Let's now observe simple examples of wave counts using real price charts so you can have an idea about the details and problems that can emerge when we deal with real markets. Take a look at this chart. Pause the video and see if you can detect five waves going up and three waves going down as the Elliott wave theory suggests. This wave count is reasonable because it doesn't break any of the five rules that we established previously. Wave 2 doesn't extend beyond the origin of wave 1. Wave 3 is not the shortest wave. Wave 4 doesn't retrace into the territory of wave 1. The impulse waves can be broken down into five subwaves each, although that can be hard to see, and wave 3 surpasses wave 1. Just for the sake of illustration, in this other chart, you can see a clear example of five waves going to the downside. It's worth mentioning that the Elliott wave rules are exactly the same for bullish and bearish markets. But it's easier to study what happens in bullish markets first, 
and then transfer that knowledge to bearish markets later. Given these rules, let's now go deeper into the study of motive waves. There are mainly two types of motive waves, the impulse wave and the diagonal triangle. The impulse wave, as it was already mentioned previously, is the wave that goes in the same direction of the wave in the immediately larger degree. In other words, waves 1, 3, 5, A and C are considered to be impulse waves. Waves 2, 4 and B are corrective waves. Diagonal triangles are a particular type of impulse wave where the collection of subwaves form a triangular shape in the chart. There are two variations of diagonal triangles, the leading diagonal and the ending diagonal. The terms leading and ending refer to where the triangles appear. When the diagonal triangle occurs in waves 1 or A, they are called leading diagonals because they lead to other impulse waves like waves 3 and 5 in the case of a leading diagonal happening in wave 1, or wave C in the case of a leading diagonal happening in wave A. Ending diagonals are impulse waves that terminate the wave in the immediately larger degree. In other words, ending diagonals can only happen in wave 5 or wave C. If you want to know more about chart patterns like triangles, check out the Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Chart Patterns in the video card. In this image, you can see an illustration of a leading diagonal happening in wave 1. Notice how the subwaves form a triangular shape highlighted by the blue converging lines. In this other image, you can see the other possible place where a leading diagonal triangle can happen, which is in wave A. Here you can see an ending diagonal happening in wave 5. This ending diagonal triangle would finish the motive wave in the immediately larger degree. The other possibility for an ending diagonal is in wave C, as you can see in this other image. Even though leading and ending diagonals have five waves, these waves sometimes respect peculiar patterns. Leading diagonals can be broken down into two patterns of five waves. The more intuitive pattern is the one where five and three waves alternate. This is also known as the 53535 pattern, as you can see in the image. Another possibility of leading diagonals is a pattern where only three waves appear in each of the five waves of the triangle as it is shown in the image. This is a case where waves 1, 3 and 5 inside a triangle would have three waves instead of five. Ending diagonals always respect the three wave pattern as a rule. It's more common for leading and ending diagonal patterns to be contracting, but they can also be expanding. Whether we are talking about contracting or expanding triangles, the rules for the subwaves remain constant. For the sake of illustration, let's observe an example of the last common expanding triangle. In this image, you can see how price reverses after the fifth wave of the triangle is completed. In this next image, you can see the breakdown of the subwaves of this expanding triangle. One of the challenges you'll find with Elliott wave counting is that the different wave degrees are not clearly defined in certain places, and that's something that will confuse you in real-time charts. You have to pay attention to certain kinds of details here as well. For example, we know that one of the rules of Elliott Wave is that wave 4 cannot retrace into the territory of wave 1 if we're talking about impulse waves, but that can happen if we're talking about a triangle. Notice that in the larger wave degree that composes this triangle, the wave 4 does retrace deep into the territory of wave 1. However, in the smaller wave degree, that doesn't happen because we are talking about impulse waves within a triangle. Given these details about motive waves, we must now move on to the study of corrective waves, which is a bit more intricate and sometimes a bit complicated. This is one of the disadvantages of the Elliott wave theory, as you'll learn later on. For now, let's observe the classic rules for the corrective waves. There are mainly four types of corrective waves, the zigzag, the flat, the triangle, and the complex, which is a combination of zigzags, flats, and triangles. Let's begin by exploring the zigzag type of correction. The zigzag follows a 5-3-5 pattern, meaning that wave A breaks down into five subwaves, wave B breaks down into three waves, and wave C breaks down into five waves. Another rule about zigzags is that wave B must never retrace beyond the origin of wave A. One general guideline of zigzags, remembering that guidelines are not rules, 
is that wave C will usually extend beyond wave A, but it doesn't have to. There are more complicated types of zigzag formations called the double zigzag and the triple zigzag. The peculiarity of these types of zigzags is that they are connected by a wave X, which is a three wave pattern usually. For example, the double zigzag is composed of two ABC formations connected by one wave X in the middle. The first ABC pattern is labeled as W, and the second ABC pattern is labeled as Y. The triple zigzag is composed by three ABC formations connected by two waves X. The third ABC pattern after the second wave X is labeled as Z. From these formations, it's easy to see that the possible combinations of corrective waves can get pretty complicated. The second type of corrective wave is the flat, which has three subtypes. They are called the regular flat, the expanded flat, and the running flat. All flats can be broken down into three waves that follow a 335 pattern. There are two rules that spiral from this notion. In a flat, wave A must not be a triangle formation. The other rule is that wave C will unfold as either an impulse wave or a diagonal triangle. One characteristic that differentiates flats from zigzags is that wave B retraces near or beyond the origin of wave A. The degree to which that happens is what leads to the three different types of flats. In a regular flat, wave B will retrace near the beginning of wave A, and wave C will end near the end of wave A. In an expanded flat, wave B will retrace beyond the origin of wave A, and wave C will extend beyond the end of wave A. This is also known as an expanded pivot formation in other modes of analysis. In a running flat, wave B will retrace beyond the origin of wave A, and wave C will fail to extend beyond the end of wave A. The third type of corrective wave is the triangle, which has two main types, the contracting and the expanding triangles. The contracting triangles have three subtypes, the ascending, the descending, and the symmetrical. The expanding triangle has only one type, which is often referred to as the reverse symmetrical triangle. The rule about triangles is that they must unfold into five waves labeled from A to E, and at least four out of these five waves must develop a zigzag type pattern. Let's quickly review the overall shape of each type of triangle starting with the contracting type first. The first contracting triangle is the ascending which is marked by ascending lows and flat highs. Then we have the descending triangle, which has descending highs and flat lows, and the symmetrical triangle, which has descending highs and ascending lows. In the expanding triangle type, we have the reverse symmetrical triangle, which is marked by ascending highs and descending lows for higher highs and lower lows. If you are interested in chart patterns like triangles, please check the Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Chart Patterns in the video card. One main difference between contracting and expanding triangles is that wave C is allowed to surpass the start of wave B in an expanding triangle. Triangles mainly appear in four places, the wave 4, wave B, final wave in a double 3 or triple 3 combination, which we'll talk about in a moment, or in wave X. Triangles are not expected to appear in wave 2 unless we are talking about a corrective combination. We move on now to the study of complex corrective patterns, which are combinations of zigzags, flats, and triangles separated by waves X. Let's begin with the double 3 combinations because they are easier. Double 3 combinations can appear in 6 forms. 2 flats, 1 flat and 1 triangle, 1 flat and 1 zigzag, 2 zigzags, one zigzag and one flat, or one flat and one triangle. Another way of seeing this is that the double three combination follows the pattern WXY. The triple three combination pattern follows the WXYXZ pattern. Triple three corrective patterns can appear in the following 12 forms. Three flats, two flats and one zigzag, two flats and one triangle, a flat zigzag and a flat, a flat zigzag in a triangle, a flat in two zigzags, three zigzags, two zigzags in one flat, two zigzags in one triangle, a zigzag, a flat, and a zigzag, 
a zigzag in two flats, and a zigzag, a flat, and a triangle. The wave X that separates the double three or triple three patterns can be any of the three patterns, meaning they can be either a zigzag, a flat, or a triangle. One peculiarity here is that triangles can never be the first pattern in a corrective pattern or appear more than once in a double three or triple three corrective pattern. Double three and triple three corrective patterns are probably the most challenging aspect of Elliott wave theory, especially when trying to deal with these in real time charts and in multiple wave degrees. Charts can get pretty messy and overwhelming. Now we move on to the study of certain peculiarities of waves like wave extensions, truncation, alternation, and equality. Let's begin first by talking about wave extensions. Wave extensions happen when one of the impulse waves display additional subdivisions in such a way that the subdivisions appear to be in the same wave degree. This will cause one of the impulse waves to be unusually larger than normal. Wave extensions can happen in any of the impulse waves, but they are more likely to occur in wave 3, which is usually the largest and strongest wave. In this illustration, you can see a hypothetical representation of an extended wave 3. The subwaves of wave 3 appear to be in the same degree as the other impulse waves, which are one degree larger. Wave truncation is simply when wave 5 fails to surpass the end of wave 3. In this image, you can see a hypothetical example of a truncated wave 5. Unlike wave 3, which is required to surpass wave 1, wave 5 doesn't have to surpass wave 3. The principle of wave alternation or guideline of wave alternation is a more nuanced aspect of wave theory. It claims that patterns in the same wave count should alternate their type. For instance, if wave 2 is a simple and sharp correction, wave 4 should be complex and flat. Within a three wave corrective pattern, the B wave should be different than the A and C waves. In a three wave corrective pattern, if the A wave is simple, and the B wave should be complex. The principle of alternation also applies to complex corrective patterns. The exception to the alternation principle is that there should not be alternation between waves 2 and 4 of a triangle pattern. The guideline of wave equality suggests that if one of the impulse waves are extended, the other two remaining waves will be of equal size, roughly speaking. For example, if wave 3 is extended, which is the most common scenario, and wave 1 and wave 5 will have roughly the same size. However, that can happen with any impulse wave. If wave 1 is extended, then waves 3 and 5 will have roughly the same size, and it logically follows that if wave 1 and 3 have the same size, wave 5 could be extended. Elliott wave theory is employed in alignment with Fibonacci ratios, which will give probable projections to the trader in terms of price and time. In other words, Fibonacci ratios will guide the trader in knowing how far future waves should go in relation to already existing waves and the time duration of these waves as well. Before we explore the basics of Fibonacci projections for Elliott waves, we should understand the fundamental relationship between the Fibonacci sequence and Elliott waves. The basic 5-3 pattern that underlies Elliott waves is based on two Fibonacci numbers. Summing the 5 impulse waves with the 3 corrective waves, we get 8, which is also a number in the Fibonacci sequence. If we go 1 wave degree further, we get 21 waves within the motive wave and 13 waves in the corrective wave. Both 21 and 13 are numbers in the Fibonacci sequence, and they sum up to 34, which is also in the sequence. Looking at a third wave degree, we would have 89 waves in the motive part and 55 waves in the corrective part, summing up to 144 waves. Once again, all numbers in the Fibonacci sequence. As a general guideline when projecting future waves, the most powerful Fibonacci ratios should be used. These are the 161.8, 200, 261.8, 300, and 361.8. For example, wave 3 should fall near any one of these ratios if we are measuring it against wave 1. The same is true for wave 5 in comparison to wave 1 or wave 3. In the case of corrective waves, the trader should mainly look for the 61.8, 50, and 38.2% ratios for simplicity's sake. For example, wave 2 should be either 61.8, 50, 
or 38.2% of wave 1. The same is true for wave 4 in relation to wave 3. An intuitive pattern happens in waves A, B, and C. Wave B, in general, will be either 61.8, 50, or 38.2% of wave A. And wave C will be between 161.8 and 361.8 of wave A. This is not true, of course, once we begin to talk about the exceptions of more complex corrective wave counts. The point is that you can always make good projections by following the most powerful Fibonacci ratios. Fibonacci ratios also work in combination with Elliott waves in the horizontal axis of the chart, meaning that there is a time-based Fibonacci relationship between Elliott waves. For example, if the time it takes to form wave 1 is considered 100%, then the termination of the other impulse waves is likely to follow a Fibonacci ratio like 161.8 or 261.8%, for example. Let's observe a real example of the vertical and horizontal Fibonacci ratios working in the same wave count. In this image, we have a straightforward wave count. You can pause the video now and try to count the subwaves to see if you can just as an exercise. In this next image, you can see that I plotted a Fibonacci tool on wave 1. Notice how wave 5 terminates almost exactly at the 200% ratio. In this next image, you can see a Fibonacci time 2 plotted from the beginning to the end of wave 1. Notice how wave 5 terminates at the 461.8% ratio. You can try different measurements to find different Fibonacci ratios intersecting. For instance, if I plot the Fibonacci time 2 from the beginning of wave 1 to the end of wave 3, you'll see that the 161.8% ratio falls almost exactly where the 461.8% ratio from the last image fell. That would be a temporal Fibonacci convergence. We can find yet a third temporal convergence in there by plotting the Fibonacci time 2 from the beginning of wave 3 until the end of wave 3. And you see that now the 200% ratio falls roughly in the same area as the last two images we analyzed. Let's take another real example, now from the one hour chart of Tesla. Observe that now we have a wave count in a bearish market. If we plot a Fibonacci extension from the beginning of wave 3 until the end of wave 4, we observe that the end of wave 5 falls almost exactly at the 161.8% ratio. In this other image, you can see that the Fibonacci ratio tool plotted from the beginning to the end of wave 3 will point to the same level but now with a 200% ratio. In this next image, we can see the Fibonacci time 2 plotted from the beginning of wave 3 to the end of wave 4, following the plot pattern of the Fibonacci extension tool. Notice how the 200% ratio points almost perfectly to the ending point of wave 5. In this image, we can see the Fibonacci time 2 plotted from the end of wave 1 until the end of wave 3. Now the 261.8% ratio is pointing to the same area, predicting the end of wave 5. Interestingly enough for the followers of this channel, if we plot a standard pitchfork using the beginning of wave 3 as the A axis, and the beginning and end of wave 4 as the B and C axis respectively, you see that price respects the lower line of the pitchfork pretty well. In this other image, we can see yet another tool pointing to the same area. This is a Fibonacci channel. The range of the orange area, which is the result from plotting the channel using points 2, 3, and 4, is then extrapolated using a Fibonacci ratio to create the gray channel. Notice how the gray channel captures the end of wave 5. Let's now move on to how to trade the Elliott waves as a beginner. If you want to trade just using Elliott waves, you will need to get deeper into the methodology. This is just a beginner's guide. However, with what you have in this course, you can already use the theory to your advantage in certain situations. For example, let's say you have a suspicion that price will reverse after a simple bearish reversal divergence in the RSI, as we can see in this chart. As you may know, the problem with divergences is that they can continue happening, generating a series of false signals that would be obviously bad for any trader. This is a situation where the Elliott wave theory can help by providing a roadmap for you to see if price is indeed about to reverse. It's not the only tool by any means, but it can be helpful. The way you do this is by performing a wave count on the recent price action. 
In this image, you can see an example of a valid wave count that supports the idea that this bearish reversal divergence indeed precedes a major reversal. Notice that we have an example of an extended wave 5 in here, and following the principle of equality, waves 1 and 3 are roughly the same size, even though wave 3 is slightly larger than wave 1, which is in perfect alignment with the theory rules and guidelines. According to this wave count, the market is about to reverse to the downside with more significance. Before seeing the outcome, let's quickly perform a Fibonacci analysis of this wave count. In this chart, you can observe the Fibonacci time tool being plotted from the beginning of wave 1 until the end of wave 2. Notice how the probable end of wave 5 is intersecting with the 461.8% ratio, which is additional evidence that this is indeed a reversal. You can also plot the Fibonacci time tool from the beginning of wave 1 of 5 until the end of wave 3 of 5. Notice how the 200% ratio is now intersecting with a probable reversal point. In other words, we have two Fibonacci time ratios happening in the same place. Let's observe now the vertical Fibonacci ratios. In this image, you can see the Fibonacci ratio tool being plotted on wave 3. Notice how the 200% ratio falls almost exactly in the area we have been looking for the major reversal. This is also true if we plot the Fibonacci ratio tool on wave 1 of 5, as you can see in this other image. We can also plot the Fibonacci extension tool from the beginning of wave 1 to the end of wave 4, and you'll see that the area of interest is correlating with the 100% ratio. The point here is that we have a valid wave count to support the original reversal divergence idea, and we have several Fibonacci ratios converging to the same area, both in the vertical and the horizontal axis of the market. Beyond that, notice that the current candle is an inside candle, which means a temporary stop in price. That can happen before a reversal. If you want to know more about candlestick patterns and their meaning, please check the Ultimate Beginner's Guide to Candlestick Patterns in the video card or the video description. Let's now see the outcome of this trade idea. In this image, you can see how the area of interest indeed was a major turning point in this market. To summarize the beginner's way of using the Elliott Wave Theory to trade, you should use the rules and guidelines to perform wave counts that support an already existing idea and also use convergence of Fibonacci vertical and horizontal ratios in order to build strength in the analysis. It's time now to explore the main advantages and disadvantages of the Elliott Wave Theory. Let's begin by taking a look at the advantages first. The first thing that becomes clear when a trader begins to use the Elliott Wave Theory is the sense that the trader is no longer lost as to where price action is headed next. In other words, the theory provides a detailed roadmap for the trader to navigate the market. The second advantage is that the Elliott Wave Theory is an established trading methodology among not only retail traders, but a few institutional traders as well. There will be certain types of traders who will specialize only in Elliott Wave Counting in order to trade. In terms of disadvantages, there are a few. As you probably were able to tell throughout this course, there are too many arbitrary rules in the Elliott Wave Theory. This can make the trader's life very complicated in real time. The greater the number of rules and guidelines to follow, the greater the degree of deliberation a trader must do, and the greater the chance of analysis paralysis. That's especially true if the trader is trying to keep track of too many wave degrees at once. The second disadvantage is that wave counting is subjective. Two different traders can look at the same piece of price action and arrive at two different wave counts. That is something that adds to the overwhelming effect of this methodology, and it can also lead to hesitation and analysis paralysis eventually. The third disadvantage is that the Elliott wave theory has no science behind it. It's based on the anecdotal evidence collected by Ralph Nelson Elliott. We can certainly see that the markets do follow the 5-3 wave pattern sometimes, but the theory lacks a solid scientific foundation, which is important because it's easier to trust the method if you have a solid scientific backbone. This finishes the ultimate beginner's guide to the Elliott wave theory. I hope you were able to learn something new and useful with this video. I have many different ultimate beginner's guides in this channel. You can check them out in the YouTube card or in the video description, or by searching the channel main page. If you're interested in becoming one of my students and learning how to trade with the best trading tools available today, 
please check out my paid courses in the video description. If you enjoyed the free material I produce here on YouTube, please help support the channel by clicking the like button, subscribing to the channel, activating the notifications, and leaving your feedback below in the comment section. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next videos. Take care.